Growing up in the shadow of the cross, my life was a series of rituals and routines. The Catholic school was my world from the tender age of five, where the same thirty-five faces became the backdrop of my childhood. It was a small, insular environment where everyone knew everyone else's business, and secrets were as rare as a snow day. Grade school was a battleground, not of academics, but of social hierarchies. The same kids I met in kindergarten were the ones I graduated with nine years later. Bonds were formed, alliances made, and enemies identified. The horror stories weren't about ghosts or ghouls. They were about the cruelty children could inflict on each other. Being different was a sin worse than any listed in the good book we studied daily. High school brought a different kind of terror. Our math teacher, a man who had once held the title of president and wore the collar of a priest, fell from grace in a scandal that rocked our small community. His relationship with a student, one he claimed began only after the student's 18th birthday, led to his expulsion and defrocking. The school erased him from its history as if he were a mistake in a ledger that could be corrected with enough whiteout. College was a breath of fresh air in comparison. The Catholic identity was there, but it was more of a whisper than a shout. Priests and nuns were present but blended into the background of a liberal arts education that encouraged free thought and exploration. As I walked across the stage at graduation, the weight of those years felt both heavy and strangely light. The school had been a crucible, shaping me with fire and pressure. I emerged not unscathed, but stronger, wiser, and ready to face a world far bigger than the one enclosed by the school's walls. The real horror was not in the stories we told in hushed tones but in the realization of how much we had to learn about compassion, acceptance, and the true meaning of faith. I remember the first day I walked through the gates of that private Lutheran school. The building, with its towering steeple and stained glass windows, seemed to cast a long shadow over my childhood. I was the poor kid, the one whose clothes were a little too worn, whose backpack had seen better days. The whispers started on day one and never stopped. Every day was a gauntlet of snickers and sideways glances. The bullies found fuel in my second-hand shoes and the off-brand pencils I clutched tightly in my hands. Even the teachers had their moments, their disappointment palpable when my supplies didn't match the quality of my peers. It was as if the very walls of the school echoed their disdain. The church pews became my weekly reminder of isolation. As we recited verses and sang hymns, I felt the weight of a thousand judgments. When I dared to question the memorization of verses, I was met with a week's detention, a punishment that seemed to confirm my doubts rather than dispel them. The day I brought dollar store tissues was the day I became invisible. Ostracized for an entire semester, I navigated the halls and classrooms like a ghost, my presence acknowledged only by the absence of kindness. The depression that took root was a heavy, unyielding thing that seemed to grow with each passing grade. But then, high school came like a sunrise after a long, dark night. Public school was a different world, one where the shadows of my past could not reach. I made friends, real friends, who saw past the superficial to the person I was inside. My grades reflected a newfound confidence, and I thrived in the warmth of acceptance. Looking back, I realized the education I received at that Lutheran school was exceptional but the lessons I learned went far beyond academics. I learned about resilience, about the strength that comes from enduring hardship. And I learned about the kind of person I wanted to be, one who would never make another feel the way I had. As I stand on the threshold of adulthood, I know that my future children will never walk the halls of a private school. They will learn in places where kindness is as valued as knowledge, where they are free to be themselves without fear and they will know, always, that they are more than the sum of their belongings. The scars of those early years have faded, but they have not disappeared. They are a reminder, a silent testament to a journey from darkness into light. And as I move forward I carry with me the hope that no child will have to endure what I did, 
and the determination to make it so. I remember those afternoons vividly, the transition from the bustling, nominally Church of England school during the day to the somber atmosphere of the madrasa for two hours every weekday afternoon. The contrast was stark, almost jarring. We were ushered into a dimly lit room where the air hung heavy with the scent of old books and the faint sound of recitations filled the air. It was a place of quiet reverence, or so it seemed at first glance. Our teacher, a man whose demeanor belied his darker tendencies, commanded respect with his stern gaze and strict discipline. He taught us the Quran, but his methods were far from gentle. He wielded a piece of wood salvaged from a broken chair, a crude tool that left its mark on more than just our pronunciation. Mistakes were met with sharp blows to the back of our hands or the soles of our feet. Sometimes he would opt for a length of hose, the sting of which was enough to make us flinch at every syllable. But it wasn't just physical punishment that defined those afternoons. There was an undercurrent of fear, a sense of unease that permeated the room whenever he entered. Whispers circulated among us about his behavior outside the madrasa, a darkness that he kept carefully hidden within those walls. Tales of his inappropriate advances towards women on buses circulated among us, a silent warning to keep our distance. One punishment stands out vividly in my memory, the chicken position. It was a contortion of limbs meant to humiliate and punish simultaneously. Arms wrapped around legs, hands clasping ears, we stood in awkward silence against the wall, sweat beating on our foreheads as minutes stretched into eternity. The climax of it all came one fateful day when a classmate found themselves in that vulnerable position. The crack of timber against flesh echoed through the room, a sound that seemed to freeze time itself. The teacher's rage manifested in a flurry of blows across the student's back, leaving welts as a cruel testament to his power. It was then that the facade shattered, and the reality of our situation became painfully clear. We were not just students learning the Quran. We were victims of unchecked authority, trapped in a cycle of fear and compliance. Years have passed since those days, but the memories linger like scars etched into my mind. The madrasa may have been a place of supposed religious education, but it was also a breeding ground for abuse, a dark secret hidden behind closed doors. And as I look back, I realize that the true horror was not in the physical pain inflicted but in the psychological scars that may never fully heal. I walked the familiar halls of St. Mary's with a sense of dread that had become my constant companion. The walls, once thought to be the color of purity, now seemed to close in on me, a reminder of the years that felt more like a sentence than an education. In third grade, the memory of Michael being bound to his chair was as vivid as if it had happened yesterday. The thick tape across his mouth, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and defiance. It wasn't just the silence that followed. It was the message it sent to all of us. No one was safe from the wrath of authority. By eighth grade, the divide between boys and girls had become more pronounced, the separation in gym class a physical manifestation of the invisible barriers we felt every day. The day we found Jason cornered by desks, his leg jutting out awkwardly, was the day I realized that the school was more prison than sanctuary. The nun's reaction, her strength as she flung Jason out like he was nothing, was terrifying in its intensity. Years later, the call from my mom confirmed what we had all whispered but never dared to speak aloud. Mr. Thompson, our seventh grade teacher, had been arrested. The boys, the targets of his inappropriate jests, were now the faces of a tragedy we had all sensed but couldn't stop. But it wasn't all darkness. Amidst the shadows, there were slivers of light, friends who understood without words, shared looks of solidarity during the longest of days, and the small victories when we managed to find laughter despite it all. As I moved on to high school, the weight of those eight years began to lift. I found teachers who encouraged questions instead of silencing them, classmates who hadn't learned to fear their own voices, and a world that was larger and kinder than the one I had known. Looking back, 
I see those years at St. Mary's not just as the worst of times, but as a crucible that forged me. I emerge not broken, but resilient, not silenced, but with a voice that I now knew how to use. And for that, in some strange way, I am grateful. The end of that chapter was not just an escape, but a beginning. A clear, definitive start to a life where I was no longer caged by desks or expectations, but free to write my own story. The memories of my time at that religious school haunt me like shadows in the dark, whispering of pain and injustice that still reverberate through my life. The physical abuse I endured there is a wound that refuses to heal, a constant reminder of the horrors hidden behind the facade of education and community service. It started with one teacher whose temper knew no bounds. His anger was a storm that raged unchecked, and I was caught in its destructive path. I can still feel the weight of his hands on my shoulders, his grip tightening like a vice as he accused me of incompetence. The confrontation escalated quickly, his voice a thunderous roar that drowned out reason. Before I knew it, I found myself pinned to the ground, his knee pressing into my chest, stealing the air from my lungs. The bruises faded, but the memory of that day remains etched in my mind like a scar. What stings even more is the lack of repercussions. His actions were dismissed as a momentary lapse in judgment, a mere slap on the wrist that did little to deter his abusive tendencies. And as if to mock justice, he ascended to the position of principal after my departure, a grim testament to the system's failures. The horrors extended beyond the school gates, intertwining with the toxic tendrils of my family life. A violent outburst from my father left me with a black eye and a concussion, yet instead of sympathy, I was met with blame and dismissal. My teachers, who were supposed to be protectors and mentors, echoed my father's sentiments, insinuating that I must have provoked such violence. The nightmare continued as my father's twisted beliefs found reinforcement in the circles he frequented. The same institution that turned a blind eye to my suffering now embraced him and his abhorrent views. His casual remarks about the acceptability of teacher-student violence cut deep, a deliberate twist of the knife in my already wounded soul. And then there was the local paper, painting a rosy picture of the school's contributions to the community. It was a sickening display of hypocrisy, a facade carefully crafted to conceal the darker truths lurking beneath. The accolades they received felt like salt in my wounds, a bitter reminder of the lies and betrayals that defined my experience. Years have passed, but the scars remain. The nightmares may have subsided, but the memories continue to whisper their tales of pain and betrayal. It's a reality I carry with me, a burden that shapes my view of institutions, authority, and the fragility of trust. The ending may not offer closure but it's a stark reflection of the harsh realities many endure in silence, unseen and unheard. My years at that Christian school were a blend of camaraderie and oppression, a dichotomy that shaped my views on education, religion, and authority. From kindergarten to eleventh grade, I navigated a world that seemed both familiar and alien, where friendships blossomed but freedoms withered under the weight of strict doctrines. The early years were marked by a sense of belonging. The small class sizes fostered tight-knit bonds, shielding us from the usual trials of teasing and bullying. I struggled academically, not due to lack of effort but because traditional teaching methods failed to accommodate my learning style. There was a brief respite during one principal's tenure. He understood my needs and offered alternative assessments, a lifeline in an otherwise rigid system. Sadly, his passing ushered in a new era of detachment and indifference from school leadership. High school unveiled the school's true colors, veiled under the guise of moral guidance and discipline. Gender segregation became more pronounced, with rules dictating where boys and girls could sit, dance, and interact. Dating was frowned upon, replaced by a fervent emphasis on courtship and marriage ideals, epitomized by the mandatory readings of I kissed dating goodbye during chapel sessions. 
the school's moral policing extended beyond romantic relationships. Openly gay students were shown the door, their identities deemed incompatible with the school's beliefs. Others faced expulsion for mundane teenage behaviors like weekend drinking or engaging in consensual relationships, the severity of punishment starkly contrasting with the school's purported values of compassion and understanding. As for academics, the school's priorities were glaringly evident. Students who struggled, like myself, were often overlooked or relegated to the sidelines. My role as a caretaker for a friend with mental health issues was a testament to the school's lack of resources and empathy in dealing with complex student needs. Even my parents' pleas for proactive intervention fell on deaf ears, leading to a disheartening realization of my insignificance in the school's eyes. The breaking point came with a damning phone call to my parents, heralding my impending academic failure despite their previous requests for support. Dropping out, and pursuing a GD was a liberating yet challenging decision, one that propelled me into college ahead of my peers and towards a path of self-discovery and success. Reflecting on those tumultuous years, I see the school not as a beacon of education but as a cautionary tale of unchecked authority and harmful ideologies. The friendships forged there, now spanning decades, are testaments to resilience and shared experiences. While I wouldn't recommend the latter years of that school for anyone seeking a nurturing environment, the lessons learned and bonds formed endure as reminders of strength amidst adversity. When I was twelve, my best friend disappeared from our public school. He had been diagnosed with epilepsy, and his parents, fearing ridicule from other kids, sent him to a Christian school. They thought he'd be safer there, among children taught the ways of compassion and kindness. A year passed, and he returned, his eyes hollow, his laughter gone. He said, There's nothing Christian about Christian school. The weight of his words hit me harder than any sermon I'd ever heard. At that school, he was different, and different was not welcomed. His seizures became spectacles, moments for mockery rather than concern. The teachers turned blind eyes preaching forgiveness while practicing neglect. The golden rule was tarnished with each snicker and pointed finger. He told me stories of isolation, of whispered cruelties, and of a loneliness so deep it was palpable. The kids there, draped in piety, were experts in exclusion. They used their words like daggers, their glances like ice. He was an outsider in a place where belonging should have been a given. But he endured— found solace in books, in the quiet corners of the library. He grew stronger in solitude, his character forged in the silent fires of his trials. When he returned to public school, he was different again, resilient, wise beyond his years. We welcomed him back, not with pity, but with respect. He had faced trials we could scarcely imagine, yet he emerged not with bitterness, but with a quiet dignity that none could deny. In the end, he taught us all what true Christianity was about, not the hollow words of those who preach, but the actions of one who lives with grace under pressure, who forgives even when forgiveness is not asked. He was the most Christian among us, without ever trying to be.